In the last video, we derived the expression for uh, the perturbative correction to the kinetic energy due to relativistic effects. Uh, we found that the scale of this contribution is on the order of alpha squared smaller than the classical kinetic energy that we initially took, which makes it an ideal problem to use perturbation theory on. However, it's important to keep in mind that for a fixed principal quantum number n, the hydrogen atom spectrum is heavily degenerate. This implies then that we need to resort to the first order correction to the energy from degenerate perturbation theory, which uh, given the n square degeneracy of the hydrogen atom would imply uh, diagonalizing a n square by n square matrix. Uh, this quickly gets out of hand already for n is equal to four, you would have to diagonalize a 16 by 16 matrix. So we should, before continuing, uh, we should stop and think for a moment if there is a way to take advantage of this loophole in degenerate perturbation theory uh, to simplify the calculations. Okay, so if you want to use the general perturbation theory. Uh, this would mean diagonalizing a n square uh, by n square matrix. And if you recall, we there was a, a special rule that said that if you're faced with a problem of finding the first order correction to the energy of a degenerate state, we should look for a Hermitian operator, which commutes with both the unperturbed Hamiltonian and the perturbation Hamiltonian, uh, in which case uh, we can use the first order correction from non-degenerate perturbation theory. And the important, uh, another important point is that they not that operator not only has to commute with the two Hamiltonian terms, but it must also have degenerate, uh, non-degenerate eigenvalues. It has to have distinct eigenvalues. If that's the case, then you can use the eigenstates of that operator as your basis. So to summarize, So a loophole for degenerate perturbation theory was look for an operator, which we denote, we can denote by a hat, which commutes with both the unperturbed Hamiltonian and the perturbation term. Uh, and it has to have eigenstates, which we denoted n not p and n not q. So this is just the nth energy level, and this is a stand-in for other quantum numbers. This could be orbital angular momentum, magnetic, uh, the projection of the orbital angular momentum, and so on. And uh, so it has eigenstates given by these two, so, so that uh, for each one of these eigenstates, it has distinct eigenvalues. Okay, if we can find this kind of operator, then these eigenstates form a good basis in which delta H is diagonalized and we can use non-degenerate perturbation theory. So this was just a little reminder. And for this particular case, there is actually uh, such an operator and that is the, uh, the square of the angular momentum 
and the operator for the projection of the angular momentum onto the z-axis. They both commute with the relativistic uh, perturbative term that we derived. This was given by P to the fourth and some other constants over here. So more specifically, these two operators commute with the momentum operator raised to the fourth power. And just as a brief reminder, the square angular momentum operator has uh, eigenstates NLML, which give uh, with eigenvalues h bar square l times l plus one. And this is for a fixed n. So when n is equal to n prime, let's say. The z projection of the angular momentum also satisfies an eigenvalue equation given by this. So you see that for different uh, mLs, this eigenvalue is different, which satisfies this condition. And for different Ls, for different orbital angular momentums, this equation will give you different eigenvalues, which again, satisfies this. So that means that taking this, this result together, our original basis states for the hydrogen atom already form a good basis for this perturbative term. So this forms a good basis set. Sometimes you he'll, you're, you'll hear this referred to as, these are good quantum numbers for this system. It's a, it's a similar idea. Right, so since delta H is diagonalized already in this basis, we can use non-degenerate perturbation theory. Uh, sometimes you, you'll hear this referred to as the uncoupled basis. Uh, this will be in contrast to another basis that will be useful to us in dealing with spin orbit coupling, which will be called the coupled basis. Uh, but ultimately then what this means is the first order correction from the relativistic correction to the kinetic energy is you can take the constants out. And then just use non-degenerate perturbation theory. And this uh, comes back to finding the uh, diagonal elements of this operator in this basis. We can rewrite this in terms of the kinetic energy operator. ML. Uh, and this will simplify calculations so we don't have to compute a bunch of derivatives from the momentum operator. And here, this kinetic energy operator is our unperturbed Hamiltonian minus the Coulomb potential. Uh, that we had in our original Hamiltonian. So just rewriting 
the same term over here. There should have been a square in the kinetic energy operator. And again, this is uh, equal to this. All right, so uh, plugging this back into our first order correction. So this is one kinetic energy and because it's square, we multiply it by itself. And this is just the cat N prime L M L. Uh, these states already satisfied the Schrodinger equation. So when H hat uh, not operates on these, you just get back the, uh, the allowed energy levels of the hydrogen atom for the unperturbed system. And then uh, for the potential energy terms, you're going to end up with the expectation value of one over R and one over R squared. And I recommend you go through that and check for yourself. What you end up with is E and not square. That's from the Hamiltonian acting twice on this state. It's two E and not. Times the expectation value of one over R. plus square expectation value of one over R square. So this one is from uh, the cross term where you have one Hamiltonian and one uh, term from the Coulomb potential that gives you the one over R. The one over R square um, comes from uh, this term multiplying with the other. So this is actually a, a square over here. Okay. I won't go through the details of calculating these expectation values. Um, this is the same thing as writing this. And this turns out to be equal one over n squared over a naught. You can already see that this is kind of expected because the radii of the hydrogen atom uh, of different orbits goes as n squared over a naught. So the expectation value of one over r should be one over the expected radii of the different orbits. The one over R squared term This one's a bit more complicated. This has L plus one half N cubed A naught squared. And here A naught is the Bohr radius. So putting these expressions back in here and bringing everything together, 
after some algebra. This is e n not squared two m c squared. So this is our first order correction to the energy because of relativistic effects in the kinetic energy. Um, we can again look at the scale of this correction since before we were kind of dealing with operators so the, uh, the scale comparison was a little dubious. Um, the unperturbed energy levels scaled as the square of the fine structure constant. Since the first order correction from relativistic effects scales as EN not squared, then this scales as the fine structure constant to the fourth. And we know that uh, this is on the order of 10 electron volts, which will make this on the order of 10 to the minus four electron volts, which is about the order of magnitude in the uh, corrections or in the discrepancies between the fine structure and the original results of the hydrogen atom. So this is our, our first contribution to taking into account more of the effects that are present in hydrogen. In the next video, we'll introduce a second correction, which is due to the coupling of the spin of the electron uh, to its orbital angular momentum.